let me say first because the last video ruffled some feathers and that's fine these are all the possible ways to effectively homeschool a child theoretically all these different ideas branches and waves that will work this is the way i'm going to show you it is very narrowly specifically focused so the way i show you if you're familiar with doing it this way or this way or this way and it works and you found it to work for you that's totally great and wonderful I'm showing exactly the way that I'm familiar with, the way that I have seen is foolproof and works for me. And I find works great for the child, works great for fostering the relationship between the parent and the child or the adult and the child. And so I'm gonna walk you through this airtight, very carefully explained. So this is for people who don't know, whoa, coffee. You see how perfect things go when you plan carefully? But really, this is these videos are for people who have never tried it or are worried that they won't be able to do it. And they don't know because there's a million ways out here that will not work. And there's even some ways that people might specifically be fond of that are more experimental and more uh, quote-unquote modern that people are sure will be better. But I can tell you honestly, I've seen a lot of them and a lot of them are very ineffective and a lot of them have very awful results at the end and you might not realize how bad the results are for years. So I'm specifically showing you what I know years down the road will yield incredible results, better results than, I'm gonna boldly say better, better results than 99% of public school systems and better results than a lot of private school systems because a lot of these public and private and all school systems now are using curricula that are increasingly experimental and not healthy and not good in my opinion and waste a lot of the child's time waste a lot of your time play around with things that are not tried and true and tested throw out things that have been proven for thousands of years to be effective and very clear and and just you know I don't believe that you should treat your student like a guinea pig but a lot of these curricula they do exactly that so lecture over let's get on to part two the other thing I'm gonna say the first video part one of this series I emphasized only control and discipline of your child you know, keeping, keeping the boundaries very strict and very tightly enforced and not letting any wiggle room for you as the adult or, you know, whatever, however you think of yourself, the teacher, the leader, to tell the child, okay, we're going to do this now. And the child thinks that they can negotiate their way out of it or negotiate their way into doing something else just because they don't want to do the work or they don't want to focus on school right now. There's been a lot of demonization of discipline and harsh strict boundaries in the last couple decades and I'm just gonna tell you straight up then I might get a bunch of nasty comments for this but discipline is freedom discipline is crucial discipline of yourself of everyone who is subordinate to you who you are in charge of leading it's non-negotiable and it's it goes all the way into the like nature like the boundaries of nature, you have skin that protects you from the outside world and protects your internal organs. You can't play around with that. You can't just let there be holes in your skin and let things come in and out and be like, oh, we're, we're being a little bit flexible here. That's not how, that's not how it works. And um, you might not like the idea of rigid boundaries, but even in a dance, when you're dancing with someone, the leader and the follower both have a role. And the leader has to maintain strict boundaries of how the follower can move. And the follower will push back against those boundaries. The follower has to push back against those boundaries so that it creates this tension. And that tension is what allows the dance to take place. 
if either the leader or the follower don't do their job in enforcing this, you end up with what's called spaghetti arms, where the leader and the follower, will, their arms will flop all over the place and neither one of them will be able to move the way the dance requires. The leader won't be able to move the follower firmly to where the, the follower needs to go to make the dance happen. Now, once the leader enforces strong boundaries in the dance and the follower pushes against those boundaries and realizes that they're not gonna move, then that tension creates energy and the leader can move the follower all over. And then the follower has freedom within those boundaries to do all kinds of fun things. And um, so in the same way, once you've established the boundaries with the child that they cannot during this time get up and play, they cannot decide that they wanna do less of the assignment than you've assigned them to. And granted, you're a loving parent, you're, you're gonna understand when, when you decide the boundaries can be moved a little. If they're not feeling well today, if some external circumstance, you know, you can change them. But the idea is they don't get to call the shots. And um, once they understand that and they've pushed against it and you've reinforced, no, we're not gonna budge, and they understand that and they're comfortable with that, then they can have a lot of fun within those boundaries and you can have a lot of fun with them. So this isn't to say that the learning has to be robotic and rigid. It's to say the boundaries have to be rigid, the boundaries of what is not allowed. If there's two hours set aside to do reading and math, um, the child can't say, oh, suddenly I don't wanna do reading and math right now. I wanna do something else. I wanna go play. I wanna go play with my toys. And the parent says, oh, I should let you play with your toys because whatever. That's no, it's not going to work. So now that we've exhausted this subject, let's actually get on to part two, what I want to talk about. First of all, you have to have a designated place if you're going to do it this way. A place in your house, the best is a separate room if you can afford it. If you don't have an extra room, then a corner of a room that is going to be quiet, meaning you're not going to have a lot of distractions, you're not going to have other siblings coming through, you're not going to have other family members, or it's not going to be near someone who's watching TV. You need a quiet place free from not just um, auditory but visual distractions. Again, people not coming through whatever it may be. So carve out a place. It could just be a corner of a room or half a room, or it could be a whole room. It could be a basement. It could be an attic. It could be part of their bedroom. It could be the kitchen table once it's all cleared and the meals are done. It doesn't have to be any specific thing, but it should be quiet, free from distractions. Now, the best is to find a place where you can give them a desk or a table and some wall space and clean wall space that has nothing else on it, nothing distracting. And from here, what you can do, and also maybe a bookshelf, maybe a couple shelves with some supplies and stuff. And from here, what you're gonna do is set up the rest of your learning center. This is, take this seriously. Schools, you know, spend millions of dollars setting up learning centers and you can do it in your home for free. But that doesn't mean to just, you know, do it haphazard, like have the child just lay on their stomach on their bed and, you know, do whatever they feel like doing while their TV is running in the background and their friends are calling on the phone. And um, so have this place clean, quiet, ready for learning. And having a bookshelf is really good, too, or any kind of shelf with, you know, any kind of drawers or stuff to have materials. You might have a whole bunch of ideas running through your head, and that's great. Run with all those ideas. Um, a calendar is good, so you can mark out, you know, what's, what special things are going to happen on certain days. Um, a chart showing their progress, how, how many books they read, how far they got. There could be a bunch of charts. I had charts throughout, you know, and I, I'm talking, I've done this large for a whole classroom, and I've also done this small for a single child that I was tutoring. It's all the same thing. Um, it's all the same idea in the way I'm showing you. So, um... Anyway, your place. This is your place. Have all the materials you need, pens, pencils, notebooks, ready to go. Have a place to put them when they're done. Have a place so this tabletop can be completely clear when you start the lesson. And when the lesson is done, all this stuff will be cleared off and have a place for everything. Again, if those little cubby 
things you can get from like Target or Walmart that have like, you know, little, little tiny plastic drawers are great. But, you know, you don't have to buy anything really, hardly anything. You can be creative and use what you already have most times. So place. Secondly is time. And this is the setting of a story, the time and place. Time is, I'm going to be absolutely strict with this, be rigid. Decide how many times, is it going to be just weekdays like the traditional? Or are you going to include some weekend days? How are you going to do it? It's totally up to you, but set the time from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. is going to be for math. And you can break it up more than that. Start with big chunks and then slowly break it into smaller chunks from 11 a.m. to 12 is going to be reading. And then, you know, 12 to 1 will be lunch. And the fun thing about having your kid home with you is you can teach them other stuff too. You can teach them cooking. You can teach them, you know, they can do some chores. They can help you with stuff. You can make it fun. And instead of it being a burden for you because you have your own work to get done, the child, you can incorporate the child into your own work once the, the firm discipline with kindness is established. So lunch could be, you guys could make lunch together and then eat it. Give yourselves as much time as you need. And then say at one o'clock from one to two, creative writing, however you want to do it. But have this, a posted schedule. It'll be, it'll go up on this. You should really have like a board, a bulletin board, or I would say a whole wall space, a whole blank wall space where you can tape up the important stuff that's going to be part of their schooling. So posted, firm, and then start with with def, with like giant chunks and then slowly narrow it down based on the age of the child, what their needs are, how you think it would work best. Um, so start big and then, then fill in detailed parts. And the details don't have to come until later as you start to work, see what works. So that's it. Set aside a place. This is crucial. Clean. Clear it up. Get everything out of the way. Carve out this place for your child. This is their future. This is the rest of their life. You're preparing for them. So be very specific. Be very, you know, don't let this be a shared space that gets messed up during other times of the day. This is very, very important. And when school is not happening here, there shouldn't be friends sitting up on the table eating cheeseburgers and, you know, playing board games there too. Now, again, if you don't have a place like this and your kitchen table is going to be your place, then obviously there's going to be times you're using it for other stuff. But make sure you're disciplined enough to, that during the, this, these hours, this place is 100% only for your child or children, only for learning the specific lessons that are on the schedule. Okay. That's part two.